It's a pleasant winter's afternoon. Jenny and her two boys are driving home after a Saturday morning rugby game. Everything's as it would be on any other day. But what if, just for a moment, Jenny is distracted by something? Let's see what could so easily happen. Two-year-old Toby in the back seat is badly shaken, but he is unhurt. His 13-year-old brother Jack is not so lucky. The impact of the crash has shattered his fourth vertebrae, leaving him paralysed. Worse still, the boy's mum, Jenny, has severe injuries. The isolated location of the crash means that she'll die before paramedics can reach her. How do you explain this tragedy to Jenny's family? who's responsible for the misery unleashed by this brief, violent episode. Was it really her fault? Given what's happened, pointing the finger seems both a waste of time and grotesque. Surely there's a better way to understand this and, more importantly, to stop it happening again. Everyone makes mistakes every day. That's part of being human. But on the road, those mistakes can so easily turn to tragedy it's so easy for a very small mistake to lead to death or serious injury. In the late 90s, a group of Scandinavian researchers decided to look closely at how death and serious injury occur on the roads. They found that most crashes were not the result of extreme behaviour, but of ordinary people making ordinary mistakes. So they proposed a fundamentally different approach. They called it the safe system. The neat thing about the safe system is it shows us that people don't have to die on the roads. Crashes will still happen because people make mistakes. But what we try to do is make those crashes survivable so that if a person crashes, they can walk away rather than be carried away. So we sometimes say we don't mind if the panel beaters stay in business, but we're trying to do the undertakers and the ICU wards out of business in terms of road trauma. Road trauma costs this country over $3 billion a year. It's an absolutely horrific amount of money that could be put to such better use. Well, no one wants to be a bad driver, but we all make mistakes from time to time. And in the case of driving a car, even a single mistake can lead to serious injury or loss of life. Humans are vulnerable. We're fragile creatures. We're capable of a lot. We're great drivers most of the time. But when we get it wrong, we simply are not going to be able to withstand the forces of a 100 kilometer an hour crash. We were designed, we evolved to withstand forces more like falling out of a tree or running into a rock at top speed, but not being in a half a ton or a ton of metal going along at 27 meters per second. For the first time, the safe system approach really treats the whole thing as a system rather than saying, I work in the area of education or I work in the area of enforcement or I work in the area of engineering and it's someone else's problem. The safe system approach challenges all to work together to work on the same problems at the same time. Road safety is everyone's responsibility. It's drivers, it's local politicians, it's, it's town planners, it's roading contractors, it's vehicle manufacturers and importers, it's line companies, it's everybody's responsibility. Under a safe system, we strengthen every component so that there is a failure in one component of it, whether it be the road or the roadside or the driver error, the rest of the system picks up that slack and it doesn't result in a serious injury or death to someone. Blaming road users for serious crashes has become second nature. But the truth is that even if all of us obeyed all the rules all the time, we'd still only halve the problem. And that's still far too many people dying unnecessarily. The SAFE system looks at the world differently. It's not just about reducing crashes, it's about saving us from death and serious injury. Serious road trauma is preventable. For example, there are often a greater number of scrapes and dents at roundabouts than at regular intersections. But lower speeds and more forgiving impact angles make the crash forces more survivable. It's not just about why someone crashed, the SAFE system asks why they were so badly injured. What parts of the system let them down? How could the crash forces have been reduced? 
In a safe system, a serious crash isn't someone's fault, it's a system failure. It's not about blaming drivers for the devastation of a crash, it's about asking what we could have done differently to reduce that devastation. What components can we improve to make the system more forgiving so that mistakes don't cost lives or limbs? It's not just about being reactive, it's about being proactive and asking how we can reduce risk. There are four areas the safe system focuses on. On road users, on our roads and roadsides, on our vehicles, and on the speeds we drive at. The safe system approach is about people. It takes what we know about how people think and how they behave and puts it at the center of how we design and operate our road transport system. When we drive a car, particularly on familiar roads, we can pretty much do it on autopilot. We can do it without paying close attention to the task. And that's natural and it's normal with anything we practice a lot. But we still have to be ready to assume control, to pay full attention when something unusual happens in the traffic or in the road environment. We road users are merely human. We drop the ball on a regular basis and we're made of complex, fragile bits that break easily. We can be stressed or tired. We can be affected by drugs or alcohol. And we have different levels of experience that make us anything from unfamiliar with the road to over-familiar. Sometimes drivers make errors simply because they've made the wrong decision and they don't know any better. They're new at driving or they're a learner driver. Sometimes we make mistakes because we're not paying full attention to the task or we're distracted. And sometimes we make mistakes because we've, we've broken the rules. We've decided to overtake or drive too fast because we think we're a good driver. With all that human frailty to account for, we still have a roading system designed more for cars than for people. The safe system changes that. Let's return to Jenny and her children now and take a look at what went wrong. Was her moment of inattention the sole cause of this tragedy? Let's see how a safe system would interpret it. Jenny was probably a good driver, driving on a familiar road, thought nothing would happen. But in retrospect, it's easy to see how that crash could have occurred. She may have been overconfident because she drives that road safely very often. She may have been distracted given what else was going on in the car, and she may have even been a little fatigued given her responsibilities as a mother. The road Jenny was travelling on is typical of a lot of New Zealand's roading network. It's rural, it's undivided, it's just evolved over time. Over half of our deaths and serious injuries in New Zealand occur on rural roads, very similar to the road that Jenny was driving on and often on bends. Jenny looked over her left shoulder and at that point she drifted out of her traffic lane across the narrow sealed shoulder and into the gravel. Instinctively she jerked the steering wheel to the right she crossed the centre line. At that point, she tried to correct, but by now she was out of control and sliding towards the power pole. She struck the power pole on the driver's A pillar on the right-hand side of the car at impact speeds possibly in excess of 60 kilometres per hour. At that speed, hitting an object like that, the car is going to end up in a mess. The car behind me is a typical 1990s car. Um, it's, it's registered, it's warranted, it, to all intents and purposes it seems quite safe. But what Jenny didn't know when she bought it was that it only had a two-star safety rating. It's got no airbags, it's got no active safety features that help keep the passengers alive or, or safe at the time of impact. What that meant is that when she collided with the power pole, despite the fact that both her and Jack were wearing seat belts, there was nothing else in the car to protect them from, from injury or death. Really the only safety feature in the car that was working was little Toby's car seat, and that helped keep him alive. So one of the pillars of the safe system is safe speed. And so the speed must be appropriate for the road. We can't have a one-dimensional speed approach. 100 kilometres an hour for a lot of our country's roads simply isn't appropriate. And we need to look and say, what are we asking this road to do? What are the hazards? What's the risk to the road user? 
the speed that your vehicle is travelling at prior to a crash is pivotal to the outcome of that crash. The relationship between speed and force is exponential, so small increases in speed will have a large result in the forces involved in the crash at the other end. So at 100 km per hour, you're travelling 27.7 metres a second. Now even the most alert driver takes about two seconds to respond to a hazard. So you've gone 54 metres before you've even started to shave any speed off to react to the hazard. We also know that your peripheral vision comes in at high speed. So you're only focusing on a very small area of risk. So not, not only can you not see the risks coming, you're travelling at high speed and taking a long time to react to them. Jenny was travelling on a road legally signposted at 100 kilometres an hour, giving her the impression that 100 kilometres an hour was fine. But legal isn't always the same as safe. Modern highways with barriers and interchanges typically have a four or five star safety rating, much safer than the road Jenny was on, which is likely to be only a two star road. Yet they both have the same 100 kilometre an hour speed limit. Her speed meant that her moment of distraction got her into serious trouble. Things happened too quickly for her to control. She hit that power pole with such force, the chances of serious injury or death were very high. A safe system would have saved Jenny's life and freed Jack from his life in a wheelchair. When every element of a safe system is strong and working well, the chances of death or serious injury decrease greatly. If we work backwards now, we can see how this particular tragedy might have been averted. If the speed limit on the road was an enforced 80 kilometres an hour instead of 100, or if Jenny had been driving slower, her car would have hit the pole 20 kilometres an hour slower, or she might not have hit it at all. That would have given her and her boys some survival room. If there had been a rumble strip along the edge line of that road, then that would have alerted Jenny to the fact that she was drifting out of her traffic lane, at which point she could have had the opportunity to correct her path. If there had been a wider shoulder, somewhere in the order of one metre, then Jenny would have had time to correct her path before she drifted into the gravel and lost control. We could ask ourselves, what if Jenny's car had a four or five star safety rating? So unlike the car behind me that's, that doesn't even have airbags, a, a car with a higher safety rating will have airbags, crumple zone. It would have likely had curtain airbags that prevent the occupants' heads from coming into contact with the, the A pillars or the windows inside the car. We'll have electronic stability control that may have prevented the crash from occurring in the first place. If you couple that with a lower speed before the collision occurs, it means the crash is just that much more survivable for everyone. Here's what happens to a modern five-star car in a head-on crash. Airbags deploy and the passenger cell stays intact. Compare that to a three-star car. This is actually a little safer than Jenny's, but still, the passenger compartment starts to collapse, putting the driver at risk of severe chest and leg injuries. The windscreen pops out and the dashboard is forced back into the passenger space. To see how far things have come, look what happens to a supposedly rock-solid 1959 Chevrolet. And how its modern counterpart fares in the same crash. If the car had been fitted with electronic stability control, it would probably have detected the skid and automatically applied the brakes to individual wheels and brought itself back into line. In the end, the pole is what killed Jenny. That power pole was very close to the edge of the road. It gave little room for recovery if you drift out of your traffic lane. If the pole had been shifted well back off the road, if it had been undergrounded, then Jenny would have simply gone through the fence and into the paddock in that situation and Jenny probably would have survived. That's a total of six different risk factors eliminated from a single crash, each one reducing the risk of serious injury or death. 
If all that was done, Jenny would be alive. Her son would be back playing footy again next week and her toddler Toby would grow up knowing his mum. New Zealand does tend to accept the road toll. It's like a word we use as something, a toll we're prepared to pay. But the safe system challenges that very belief and says, why do we accept that? Why are we complacent about it? We talk a lot about what causes crashes rather than what can prevent the harm. So safe system is an injury prevention or a harm minimisation approach. It says, don't go blaming the driver, don't go looking for fault. Work out how can the system be made safer? How can we strengthen the performance of all the different parts to make the system safer? It's not just about reducing the risk of serious injury and harm at a cost-effective level. I believe, truly believe we can get it to zero. We can make it a safe system. If you look at the world road toll, 1.3 million, that's the equivalent of six and a half jumbo jets crashing a day. Would you fly if six jumbo jets flew out of the sky today and tomorrow and the next day? A world with a safe transport system is a very different one. Everyone has a part to play, nobody is off the hook. We'd be driving and riding on roads where hazards were marked and minimised, roads that guided and informed us about what was coming up. Intersections would be designed to minimise crash forces when things go wrong. Speed limits would give the driver a much better steer on what speed is right for the road. We'd have vehicles with technology that could respond to conditions automatically and monitor their drivers for fatigue, alcohol and speed. We'd have alert, skilled drivers and riders who approach the task with an understanding of hazards and risks and they chose a speed that was right for the road no matter what the limit. We'd have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle warning systems and automatic crash avoidance technology. If the worst did happen, our cars would have enough crumple zones, seat belts, airbags and head restraints to give us a really good chance of escaping with minimal injury. A safe system allows for the human factors in our roading system realising we all make mistakes and accepting that our bodies have a very limited ability to withstand force. It asks how roads and roadsides can be made more forgiving of human error. It looks at how our vehicles can save lives and reduce harm. And it ensures the speeds we travel are appropriate for the roads we drive and for the other people who use those roads, like pedestrians and cyclists. The neat thing is that once we start actually creating a truly safe road system in New Zealand, horror crashes will disappear from the six o'clock news. The safe system is a proven approach. It's working brilliantly internationally. Basically, the world is divided into two types of countries, those countries that are following this approach and those that aren't. And the world leaders in the safe system approach, they have a road toll about half of New Zealand's current road toll. The safe system belongs to all of us. If we're going to create a truly safe road system in New Zealand, everyone has to do their bit. So it's a shared responsibility principle. And when we see a serious road crash out there, we need to all ask ourselves, what could we have done as a country that could have avoided that level of trauma for that family? What could we have done as individuals and as professionals who all share responsibility for safety? The beauty of this simple but profound new approach to road safety is that all of us have a part to play in it. Each of us can help reduce the risks we all face in getting around every day. If we can do that, then we can look forward to a future where we make safer journeys as part of a truly safe system.